Mr. Erickson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Yoho, for organizing this hearing and for your uh, opening remarks, which I found to be quite wise. Uh, and I would also like to thank the other members of the committee and of Congress who are, who are here today. I will briefly address the current situation in Haiti, but the focus of my remarks will be on what the United States and the broader international community should do to address the Haitian crisis in 2020. When I visited Haiti last month, one thing became very clear. Haiti today is experiencing its most profound political, economic, and social crisis in a generation. And it will get worse next January, when the Congress dissolves, there is no political accord, the economy withers, insecurity worsens, corruption remains unchecked, and millions will face emergency levels of food insecurity. How did Haiti's crisis become so severe? I see three overlapping crises. The first is the decades-long struggle for Haiti to achieve a basic level of governability in a sustainable economy. The second crisis emerges from the developments and decisions during the administration of President Jovel, Jovenel Moise, who assumed office in February 2017, and the resulting political grid, gridlock, the protests, and the country lockdown, or PEILOC, as is known in Creole, that have devastated the economy and jeopardized the well-being of millions of Haitians. And all of this has occurred against the backdrop of a third crisis, a crisis of apathy and indifference among Haiti's international allies and partners. It is this crisis of apathy that I believe this committee is best positioned to address. Haiti has suffered periods of sharp deterioration before, coups, earthquakes, hurricanes, political unrest. And in virtually every instance, the international community, led by the United States, has sought to identify core problems, work towards practical solutions, and reduce human suffering. Not every engagement has been successful, but important lessons have been learned. The first is that if the United States does not lead, no one else will step up to take our place. Second, the results have been more successful and more sustainable when the U.S. has been joined by partners across the hemisphere, as well as allies in Europe and key ins international institutions like the Organization of American States, the United Nations, and the multilateral development banks. The third lesson is that while Haiti will never achieve political consensus, uh, political compromise can be attainable. But only when the international community joins forces and Haitian political leaders understand both the stakes and the consequences. I believe the time is ripe to propose new approaches. Without a change in course, Haiti's deterioration will continue in ways that will be damaging both for the Haitian people and for the national security of the United States and our nearest neighbors in the Caribbean. As we turn to 2020, a year that will mark the 30th anniversary of Haiti's first democratic election and the 10th anniversary of the tragic Haitian earthquake that claimed so many lives, Haiti must assume a more central role on the U.S. foreign policy agenda. As an initial series of steps, I recommend the following. The first is that the United States Secretary of State should convene a ministerial level meeting of the Haiti Core Group, which consists of counterparts from Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Spain, the European Union, the United Nations, and the Organization of American States, with the objective of formulating a comprehensive strategy to help Haiti meet humanitarian needs and create a pathway for negotiations with Haitian partners for an agreed time frame for new congressional and presidential elections. Second, the United States and the core group should then spearhead a Haiti economic strategy and humanitarian relief session on the margins of the IMF World Bank annual meetings that will occur in April 2020, including international relief groups and NGOs, with the objective of identifying how to rapidly surge food aid and economic support into Haiti's hardest hit communities and ward off the possibility of severe malnutrition or even famine forecast to affect up to 4 million Haitians in 2020. Third, uh, I believe we need a comprehensive review of U.S. and international security assistance to Haiti with the objective of strengthening the Haitian National Police and ensuring that funds are not diverted either into the Haitian army or paramilitary apparatuses that threaten the rule of law and human rights. Fourth, I believe that the U.S. should consider the extension of temporary protected status, or TPS, for Haitians in the United States past the 2021 expiration date and examine the possibilities for humanitarian parole for needy Haitians or for those whose lives are at serious risk. 
And lastly, uh, the U.S. Congress could consider establishing a short-term working group of members to create a more active role for Congress to monitor developments and ensure that Haiti occupy a prominent place on the U.S. foreign policy agenda next year with the aim of a full restoration of an elected democratic government as soon as possible and certainly by no later than 2021. The crisis in Haiti, uh, in conclusion, is deep, complex, and cannot be solved either by the Haitians alone by, or by the United States, or by any other single country or international actor. However, I am confident the members of this committee, working together with the U.S. administration and the broader international community, can do considerably more to help put Haiti back to a prominent place on the U.S. regional and international agenda. Thank you. You know, I visited Haiti, uh, I think, two years ago. And one of the things that troubled me the most is when we met with the prime minister, He's talking about reinstating the army. Hmm. And to me, that was an indication that he's just not serious about taking care of his people. I cannot believe that an island that small or a place that small would need an army. I pointed out to him that Costa Rica doesn't have an army and they're doing well. I pointed out to him that I visited the police barracks, one of the police barracks, and they didn't even have a table to sit on to have lunch. Hmm. His answer was that the Constitution of Haiti requires an army. Well, Constitution <laughs> can be changed, and the people come before anything else. So if you're going to spend that money on creating an army, why not invest it in the needs for the people? I told them that I would never support any money for Haiti that goes to the army in this Congress. And the impression now that I get from everyone here is that this situation could get out of hand very quickly. And I'm very concerned for the people of Haiti. So Mr. Erickson, if this situation gets out of hand quickly, who should step in? Because obviously there's corruption, corruption at the highest level. There are gangs roaming all over Haiti. Who steps in? I mean, I know you mentioned about the European Union and, and everybody else. I mean, they got their issues. So is it time? For some, somebody else to step in? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, a few points I would like to make. Uh, the first is, for a long time, uh, the United Nations had stepped in with the support of the U.S., Latin American, and, and others. And from 2004 uh, to 2019, there was a U.N. peacekeeping force, which was large at the beginning and then tailed off at the end. Now there's a smaller political mission, but there's no peacekeeping force in Haiti today, um, which, is, which is, I think, an important uh, distinction uh, from the past uh, several years. Um, secondly, what Haiti really needs is a functional Haitian national police uh, and a judicial system. And in fact, the Haitian national police has become, and there are still problems, admittedly, but has become a more professionalized and larger force over the last 10 years with the support of the United States and with the support of the uh, United Nations. Um, I do not think that uh, uh, the Haitian army is the correct approach for the Haitian government to take it at this time. Wait, and my, my, my concern, I hate to interrupt, but sure. my concern is, I think Mr. Spran pointed out that 41 police officers were killed this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, who would want to join the police department when you have this kind of atrocity going on? No, I mean, it's an, it's an excellent point. I think that the you know, in essence, what's required in Haiti right now is some sort of uh, political solution that can alleviate the protests, restart the economy, and get some semblance of, of governance. And the concern I have right now is that that uh, solution is not going to emerge from Haiti's political actors without intensified international pressure and diplomatic engagement. 
Um, I, it is possible that what you allude to, basically a larger breakdown that forces a, uh, someone to step in, I, I can't name who that would be, uh, 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 internationally or otherwise, could take place, but I think that's still preventable. But only if we get to a political accord and the clock is ticking, because Congress, uh, uh, most of it, uh, will cease to be in office in Haiti uh, in early January. And that's going to leave a president who's already extremely embattled, ruling by decree without any broader sense of political legitimacy. The people of Haiti deserve to have the freedom and liberties that we have that we believe in. We're all born with that innate quality. And uh, if we don't change, and I want to talk to you, Mr. Erickson, you brought up the UN. The UN was there, what, for 12 years, now they're small. How effective were they, and what results do we, can we say, all right, the UN was here, they did this, and look at the great results. Obviously, it's not water or in sewers. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Congressman. Uh, so the UN was uh, present in Haiti beginning in 2004. Uh, they came in the middle of another crisis when President Aristide was ousted and then remained through the period of the earthquake and really drew back the peacekeeping mission substantially in 2017 and transitioned to a political office in 2019. The legacy of the UN in Haiti is very mixed. Um, clearly, there was success in ma maintaining the peace during that time because Haiti did not have this widespread social civic breakdown that's taking place in the last couple of years. And there is a uh, Haitian National Police, which Mr. Esperance referred to, which has become more uh, 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 a more positive force, uh, more accountable. It's bigger. There's about 5,000 I'm going to run out of Haiti. time here in three Sorry. seconds. There was 5,000 police in Haiti in, in 2010. Today, there's 15,000. Thank you. Thank you. Contra Erickson, I'd like, like to talk about our diplomacy in, in Haiti. Are staff drawdowns and uh, affecting, as I presume the answer is yes, uh, our ability to affect diplomacy and, and, and do our business, if you will, in, in Haiti? The, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Haiti is functioning in an extremely challenging environment mm -hmm. in terms of security. The uh, in terms of the staff footprint, I don't know if there have been many changes, but there have been periods where people have, for example, not had been able to have their family members um, there with them. And then, uh, you know, I would just say in general, there's been uh, fewer visitors. There have been a few high level visitors recently, um, but you're not seeing uh, perhaps the level of uh, diplomatic attention from Washington either. Mm -hmm. and, and what would that level of diplomatic attention look like in, in a perfect world? Sure. Well, one of the proposals that I made um, in my testimony is to have the Secretary of State uh, convene. Uh, in the first quarter of next year, all of the key international actors engaged mm -hmm. with Haiti, uh, which is known as the Haiti Core Group, which includes countries from Europe, Latin America, Canada, mm -hmm. and international institutions, to try to lay out what a framework would be uh, for the international community to help assist with a political solution uh, and also address the humanitarian needs. Okay, thank you. I listened to uh, my colleague from Massachusetts, and I too, I think New York is the second largest uh, number of uh, Haitians. Uh, in Queens, I have a tremendous amount. Uh, and I would be remiss if I did not say that there is, uh, you know, that of course anybody that is uh, from African American origin owes uh, a deep, great, a deep a debt of gratitude for the leaders of Haiti who decided that they were not going to be slaves and made sure that they wanted to be free. I also would be remiss if I did not say that one of the greatest frustrations that I've had in the 21 years that I've been a member of the United States Congress is the fact that for some reason, one way or the other, we seem not to have gotten Haiti right because the, 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 the situation has not changed. We've had hopes with certain times after elections with certain presidents, we, would, we thought that we were on a good path. And one way or another, something has happened, and whether it's corruption takes place, uh, whether we, the policies of the United States, the money's going to the wrong place. I know in my own district, to a large part, it's divided, depending upon who I talk to. One says to do one thing, that I should be doing one thing as a member of Congress, and another group says I should be doing something else. It's absolutely wrong. But we're trying to figure out how to do it. I think ultimately the power does rest. When I listen to you, Mr. Guyon, in the people of Haiti to decide to come together. When I see 
folks getting together, uh, as I've seen recently in Hong Kong. Uh, they're, they're fighting for democracy and trying to make sure that their voices are heard. Hopefully, you know, that their voices will break through. The same thing, I think, has to happen, and we do need the fact that we have young people and women and others involved in the political process because I don't see how we get it done without the political process uh, and to figure out how do we get good people to run and, 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 be, and, and, and governments to be transparent. You know, ultimately, I don't see how the United States is going to be able to come in and demand or say that this is the person you should vote for, et cetera. It really has to come from the ground up and through and by the people of Haiti to make that determination because we often talk about, you know, when you think about colonialism and others, that's when other people come in and try to tell folks, this is what you need to do, this is how you have to do it, uh, et cetera. And we, I don't want to be in a position to be, uh, to do those kinds of things as the United States government. That being said, I don't want us to spend our money uh, in the wrong place that will cause damage to everyday Haitians. So, for example, the, one of the things that I was concerned about, you know, I know when I talked to the State Department, they said that the U.S. assistance to the Haitian National Police has helped strengthen their capacity and increase their ranks to 15,000. However, you know, you, is that a, was that the right thing for us to do to increase? Because I don't know. Because when I looked at the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, they found that at least 42 people have died during the recent protests, and 86 have been injured. And out of the 42 deaths, at least 19 can be attributed to the security forces. So do I want to give money to the Haitian National Police if, in fact, they are promoting uh, uh, human rights violations? No. Do I want to have peace and try to make sure that people are protected uh, so that they can protest and do whatever they Absolutely. So I'm in a position of trying to determine what should we do, what should I do as a member of the United States Congress and the policies that we put forward and the money that we want to invest in, where should we do it, where should we put it, is it the right thing, is it the wrong thing? So I got a minute to go. Do I have anyone to answer those questions? Mr. Erickson. Sure. Uh, I think that one, uh, you know, very important role for Congress could be to, to go to Haiti soon and really assess the situation. Uh, regarding the question of the Haitian National Police, I think ultimately civilian security in, in Haiti is going to depend on national police, right? We don't want the army to come back. But I do think that this uh, requires more in-depth ex examination by, by Congress, either members of this committee or others who may be interested um, to investigate this. Thank you. Oh, and uh, Can Mr. Erickson repeat what he said in his testimony? I want uh, Congressman Meek to hear him. Sure. Well, just very briefly, uh, I think that, you know, I think that we were in the middle of three crises, right? The historic one that we've discussed, the acute political crisis of the last two years, and the crisis of apathy and indifference in the international community. I think this hearing can help to address that la latter one. But my proposal is, while all of this good work is going on in Haiti, to also re-energize the international community to see if it can help with some sort of political process to get Haiti past this impasse which would be not just the United States, but the other members of the core group, uh, which is a set of uh, either countries or international institutions that have been engaged in Haiti that has actually been fairly dormant over the past two years. Uh, they include uh, Brazil, Canada, uh, the European Union, France, Spain, Germany, um, as well as uh, the United Nations Organization and Organization of American States. 